Hi, I'm Sid. I'm the CEO and co-founder at GitLab, and this is an AMA where team members at GitLab ask me, preferably, hard questions, and I try to answer them. Hey, Sid. Just wanted to <clears throat> get your thoughts on the early uh, returns on the CEO Shadow Program and um, how that's you know living up to your expectations and um, what the plans are for that going forward. Yeah, um, better than expectations so far. Um, so the goal of the program is to make sure that uh, people, more people at GitLab, have kind of a global overview of the company and understand like how everything fits together. What's been ahead of expectations has been um, the collaboration with the, um, the executive team. Um, someone's mic is open who's typing. Um, the executive team has, every single member has allowed the shadow to uh, join their conversations and follow like 95, 98% of the conversations. Um, so that's been really, really good. And so they get a lot of access. Um, it's also been very, it's been fun. Like uh, um, Erica published a blog post yesterday. You can read it about our Kosla visit. I thought that was an excellent output of it. Um, Michael, who I'll give the word uh, later, I was the current uh, shadow. He, uh, for example, yesterday he did a red team exercise and at six o'clock, he was at a press event telling journalists about what he was doing and, and like representing the company in a very positive way. Um, so it's, uh, it's been really good, but I want to give it to the word Michael a bit about how is he, what's it, what's it like from hey. his perspective? Uh, so from my perspective, uh, it's been a great experience. Um, this is what my third week with GitLab. Uh, first week I, you know, uh, you know, requested to be a part of the shadow program and then the next week I was out. So it's been really exciting uh, and very humbling. Overall, I feel like I've learned more in the last week on the shadow program and at GitLab alone with um, versus the last year or so in my previous position. Uh, I, I think that is also, that's due and um, very, very highly because of the shadow program. It's kind of like, uh, you know, uh, I've already known, I knew how to manage people, but now I'm observing uh, Sid uh, and his management style and how he solves problems with people. And I feel like every day it's, uh, I'm learning a lot more uh, very rapidly. I'm starting to understand uh, the reasons why there are certain management uh, styles and ways you want to actually track things and build things. But overall, it's been an excellent experience. Uh, I feel like I've grown leaps and bounds and I'm really looking forward to the next uh, two weeks. So, yeah. Thanks, Michael. Next question is from Simon. Simon, you wanna verbalize your question? Sure. Uh, so this, the context for this is a customer, a large customer in EMEA asked about just some high level instance wide um, statistics about the code that they have in GitLab. Um, and I just wondered if we could take it a step further and start looking at code analytics. Um, the idea being customers have their code in GitLab. What actionable insights can we surface to customers from the nature of that data? Yeah, thanks for that. Um, and I'll uh, screen share. This is the issue you refer to with code Statistics, I have an opinion, and I wrote that uh, up three years ago, uh, 2015. That was a busy year. Um, but anyway, I think uh, we should have great code analytics in GitLab. And we should show a lot of things that are actionable. So it's always very important that when you have analytics, what is the action you take? So it should show code coverage, but also developer churn, code hotspots, uh, burn down charts, bus factors, test coverage, bugs for certain pieces of code, complexity like cyclomatic complexity, code added in crunch time, how many people worked on something, when things were modified, especially if you work with lots of contractors, these things are super, super useful. So 
I think those are things we should help our uh, customers uh, with. Uh, and I'll link to the issue from the agenda. So just out of interest, just as a follow up, what's the main use cases for those analytics, would you say? Is it around managing developer productivity? Or would you that's say it's more than? That's an excellent question. Um, so you, for example, developer churn, um, you want to see, hey, which are the teams where many, many different people are touching the same piece of code? That probably means that you have a problem keeping people on the same project. So, so in some companies, developers are viewed as interchangeable and they, they, depending on like the priority of that month, they work on a certain piece of code. With that, you get reduced stewardship of that piece of code. No one's really owning it. No one is responsible. No one is doing the final peer review. There is not one view in which it's made, like one mental model. So you get like a spaghetti of many mental models. So it reduces the quality. So you want to preferably see not too much different developers doing it over time. At the same time, you don't, you don't want too few. So that's the bus factor. Like, hey, if there's a certain part of the code base where there's no other people, that's not a good sign as well, because that means that uh, if one person leaves or is, has to do something else, suddenly nobody knows anymore. So you don't want it too high, don't want it too low. Code hotspots is where you see frequent changes. That's, that might be an indication that that piece of code is very complex and has, its, has too many responsibilities. So you want to reduce that, maybe split that off or, or find another abstraction or use a DSL or things like that. Burn down charts, much more about like productivity, like are we getting enough done? Obviously, these are just indicators. Hey, you, lines of code are an indicator, but uh, never use it as a final metric. Test coverage, the higher the test coverage, uh, you assume it's more reliable. Um, issues open per key for pieces of code. Like if you have code which has a lot of issues open for it, there's probably lots of bugs in it, and it's probably code you should consider refactoring. Cyclomatic complexity, the more complex, the harder to understand. You want to reduce that in general. Code added just before releases, that's like crunch time code. Like there, there's something wrong that all of a sudden we have to fix this just before we do a release out. Um, so, and uh, when piece of pieces of code were modified, it's uh, something you see when you have um, assignments where you have contractors on something for a month, you expect kind of change in that code over the month. If you only see it in the last week, probably something is going wrong in the process. It should be evenly distributed over the assigned period. If it's only happening in the last week, there's, there's something holding them back from working on it earlier, and that's not a good thing. So um, thanks for the question. I, ho I hope this was uh, insightful. Well, insightful. I hope this was useful. Definitely. Thank you. Hey, Sid. I'm just wondering what scares the crap out of you. What keeps you up at night in regards to uh, GitLab? Yeah. Thanks for that. Um, I get a question a lot, so I'm starting to write it down, but I haven't done a good job of posting it to the handbook yet, so it's open here in my editor. Biggest fears, um, scaling, uh, lowering the hiring bar, onboarding. We have to onboard a lot of people and kind of extra layers of management. Um, lowering the hiring bar, what are we doing to prevent it? Reviewing new hires, like uh, bar raising. Uh, now me and Carol are doing that. Comparing titles, um, making sure we have we have a good grip on underperformance, uh, and we identify it early and we take action. Um, then I'm I'm typing as we go because like well, I have to get this into the leadership principles. Onboarding, so what's the onboarding time? How long does it take? Do people get productive quickly? Uh, well, for like developers, do they start contributing? And salespeople, do they ramp up? Um, this is a misspelled value survey. survey. Um, I can spell. But uh, do people think that our 
values are used to kind of promote people and give people bonuses. Extra layers of management, like do we have directly responsible individuals? Is there clear job family? Is there clear org chart? Um, is our open core model working? Uh, is there velocity of what we're shipping? How many contributors do we have from the wider community? So those are, those are the things I, uh, those are the biggest fears and, and what we're doing about them. Thanks. If people think that there's different things I should focus on, feel free to speak up. Lyle, you wanna verbalize your question? Yeah, sorry, I was in the middle of typing. Um, I just wanted to talk about GitLab.com. And uh, in the handbook, we have a thing that says GitLab.com is not a role. Do you think that's still working? Um, is GitLab.com sort of like the future of GitLab? And if it is, does it make sense to make GitLab.com a role? Yep, um, I think that's still working. So the future of GitLab is GitLab, and maybe a bit of Meltano. Um, GitLab.com is just a, same, a different way of delivering the same product. It's different packaging, should be the same product. And uh, for example, like of what not to do, I saw uh, a Vault issue yesterday, which said, oh, we'll have Vault for GitLab.com, but we won't add it to our self-managed installation. Okay, well, the idea with Vault is to make sure that people in GitLab have a secure, people using GitLab have a secure store to, for their secrets. Like you add lots of secrets to GitLab, like Kubernetes credentials, environmental variables, all kinds of sensitive stuff that you wanna be a very good steward of. Um, if we ship it with GitLab.com, but not with self-hosted GitLab, we cannot say, hey, everything that's sensitive in GitLab is gonna go into or everything that's sensitive, everything that's a secret will go into Vault because we get this split between the two products. Um, so we really want to prevent that. And we want to keep it the same thing, just different packaging. Uh, just like you uh, can, I can get my, my, my hair gel, I can buy one packet uh, at the drugstore or I can buy a, a six pack at Costco. It's the same product, different way of delivering with different implications. But um, it, if we start making them different products, we get into a world of hurt. And we've seen that at our competitors where uh, changes take an extraordinary amount of time because we have two versions. We've seen that, we see that at GitLab, we got a CE and an EE distribution. We all know, well, we all know it's a lot of pain. Uh, if you ask uh, people in engineering, they'll say, yeah, it's a lot of pain and we're, we're uh, now doing an enormous effort to bring the two code bases into one repository. That's how it is. If you let them do different things, you'll end up with that inefficiency again and want to prevent that. We do expect that uh, .com will grow over time. Uh, people want to consume software as a service, preferably they don't want to be running it and you're now seeing the first big customers there. Will that go all the way? I, I think that's unlikely. I think we'll always have people that uh, host things themselves. Uh, with Kubernetes and those technologies, it gets easier to self-host things. And with like new regulations, there's more pressure to be a good steward of any data you produce as a company. So uh, there might be a movement where people take more things in-house. We shouldn't like bet on any future. We should just make sure we have two great ways of dist distributing uh, GitLab. And anything we do, like for example, collecting feedback from our users should work the same way in both products. I guess sort of my concern here is that um, .com kind of breaks the model of self-managed where an admin user on .com doesn't have the same admin privileges. They can't do some of the same, like some of the self-service things that they would expect to do on the self-managed version. And so I'd like, in the hair gel model, it's sort of like you can have a squeeze hair gel or you can have like a pump. It's the same stuff inside, but it is subtly different. And I, I like I like the squeeze and the pump. Um, yeah, I agree, it's different. And what we're seeing is that a lot of the things that we have on an instance level, we're now adding on a group level. And we're seeing that, for example, with 
ending templates, ending Kubernetes clusters with uh, single sign-on with SAML. Uh, we historically we were had most usage on self-managed, so we added things first there, and we're now adding the same things uh, to dot com, and uh, probably there we're going towards a future where there's very few things that you can do self-managed that are still relevant for .com, but you can do there even though you'd like to. I think that's that's almost going away. I can't name any example uh, where that's gonna be a permanent future. John, wanna verbalize your question? Yeah, uh, I was just wondering if you're still receiving your, your CEO mentoring, and if so, what's some good advice you've received recently, maybe around scaling the company? Yeah, I am. Uh, the name is Dan Levin. He's the old COO of Box. Uh, he's an awesome person. Uh, and the nice thing is that Kosla uh, hired him just to do that. And uh, it comes with the Kosla package. So uh, we're not paying for it separately. Um, we're not paying for it at all. Like these people invest and help you, uh, obviously, and when they invest, they get shares, but it's pretty nice of Kosla to still be supporting us uh, so many years later after the transaction. Um, and it's uh, it's been uh, really good. Uh, you asked a bit like, hey, wh what are you talking about? Um, I think there's a, to, sc to scale a company, it's a lot about uh, consistency. So we talked about, hey, the process for updating job descriptions should be very clear. Um, we, how do we do bonuses? What's the size of the bonus pool? How do we determine that? Do we give everyone the same or is, does it depend on the individual performance or not? Do we do yearly bonuses? Is, um, are we measuring if people on a PIP, in 50% of the cases, they should still be at the company after a year. We wanna make sure that PIP performance improvement plans are not the end of the road, but they are like survivable and, and you can uh, be successful at the company afterwards. Uh, we dove into our termination numbers, involuntary, voluntary termination uh, numbers. We looked at, hey, do we want to give everyone the same refresh or do we want to give half the people a refresh or do we want to do something on top for high performers? Uh, promotions, are the promotions evenly distributed throughout the company? What is what is the number it should be? Probably about 30% of the people in any year should get a promotion. Uh, but it's very important that it's distributed evenly, that there's not some managers um, making it much easier to get one and some managers making it almost impossible. We reviewed my calendar and he noticed a few things. First of all, I wasn't in a lot of staff meetings, which uh, is unusual, but I see as a good thing because I don't want to be in people's hair too much. Um, but one thing that I did change is that I'm gonna do skip level meetings. Um, so I'm gonna meet the reports of a manager without the manager present to, uh, to hear what's going on in that uh, department. He's gonna maybe do a training program for GitLab. Um, and he's gonna to try to do that remote, so that's great. Uh, talent retention program, identifying high performance uh, and things like that. So, Lots of things. All the things I talked about were just exploratory discussions. Like I am not announcing any compensation changes here on the call. It's just that we, we compensation is really important to get right. And uh, especially as we scale, I wanna make sure that I know what all the best practices are and I know what I wanna learn from experience with people who did it really good at scale. So I think I'm up next. You kind of hit on that. Uh, and I think the term is actually skip level versus level down. But I guess my question is, what do you anticipate or, or what do you most want to get out of out of those? Yeah, the term is skip level. Thanks for that, uh, Derek. Um, I think there's a few things. First of all, as a CEO, you tend to be the last person to know like a, you, your, your information you get is filtered by many, many layers before it reaches you. So I wanna give a, get a heads up if there's a problem in the company a bit early. Also, it's a way to um, 
to kind of see whether there's there's something that uh, that can be improved in the performance of the executive. Um, so it's also a way to like, hey, how can I, I'm the manager of the executive. I try to like give them feedback. This is what you can improve. This is what you should focus on. But I don't have a whole lot. I have some input on how they're managing up, but I don't have a whole lot of input of how they're managing down. So this is to get more input for like to help them coach them on the managing down. Cool. Thank you. Derek, I think you have the next question as well. Uh, that should be the same one. Ah, so cool. Thanks for that. Those were all the questions. Thanks everyone for joining and have a great day.